So we're pleased with this cooperation between the IU and UNEP and to tackle a specific issue, connecting higher education in the green economy community. Uh, it's really a community that um, YE is building around these topics and we're pleased to contribute to that uh, um, at our level. So the workforce development for the clean energy transition and climate solutions is what we will hear uh, from the speakers, but also from the panelists in the roundtable debate that will take place in, in just a bit. We will develop the whole session around uh, the Global Guidance for Education on Green Jobs, a document that you may wish to access or have accessed already and use uh, in your different settings from around the world. So without further ado, and um, unfortunately we cannot wait for everyone, but people will come in as the, um, and the webinar does progress. Uh, we're very pleased to welcome uh, initially two speakers uh, to open the session. Then we will let me, without further ado, let me uh, please introduce uh, the first speaker uh, to you. And uh, the first speaker is Sam Barrett, who's the Chief Environmental Education and Youth Unit at UNEP. And I'm very pleased to give you the floor. Sam? Thanks, Alej. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Great, super. Um, so I just wanted to say a few comments at the beginning of this really interesting webinar. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is I don't think we have all the answers. So the way I view this is an exploration um, because I don't think there is a blueprint or even a green print about how to get this right. Um, the way that we think about this is that we have eight years to cut emissions by 50%. And the way that we do that is by really transitioning the economy from the one we have to the one that we want. In order to do that, we're spending a lot of time just thinking about what are the different sectors where there's uh, high growth, high employability, but also possibly dirty carbon legacies that we need to transition. Um, and also spending quite a bit of time with LinkedIn, which uh, Noemi will speak to, to think about how we have more intensification of green jobs in the world. And so they work with 650 million job seekers and they have a very clear sense of what's happening in terms of trends, uh, in terms of growth, uh, where markets are moving, and what more needs to be done. But what they also talk about is skills. And this is where I think higher ed can play possibly a stronger role, which is moving away from certification of academic capability to working towards the certification of skills and capabilities in a broader sense. So I think the way that higher ed has worked in the past is to kind of stamp and approve people for meeting certain criteria from an academic framework. But I do think particularly on some faculties and some courses, we need to shift to thinking about the certification of a skill set that is required for a more sustainable economy. We are going to be putting more time and effort into this in the build up to Stockholm Plus 50. And we're talking to other UN entities to see how they can engage on this journey. And what we're trying to do is put the supply chain together. And the supply chain exists of students and they have the latent capability and the talent that we need for this transition. The education system that is orientated around a set of principles that need to be reformed. Uh, and they have a massive role to play as a core cog. But then also employers need to set out the opportunity for the new jobs that they want to create and their connection into education and redetermining that relationship is important as well. But around that, the UN can play an important role working with governments, with member states to think about the role that they can play. So as I said at the beginning, this is not easy because uh, if it was easy, I think there would be lots and lots more happening than possibly there is right now. But what I'm really keen to do is begin this conversation listen and learn from others and the role of UNEP in this is to facilitate a conversation with some really good thinkers on this and to see where we get to and then we'll be looking how we top up and accelerate off the back of that so a few remarks from me uh, again very much the beginning of a journey uh, and hopefully you can go further on this call and I look forward to hearing what others have to say so thank you Wonderful, Sam. You set the scene uh, uh, very uh, nicely, and it's so important indeed that we move into the future in a different way, that uh, uh, we really rethink what we do and how we do it. Uh, and it will be interesting to hear from others if this move towards more uh, uh, 
uh, focus on skill sets uh, for a more sustainable economy is what we can do and what we wish to do and how. Uh, but I will give the floor first to Pam Fredman, who's the president of the International Association of Universities, also the former rector of Gothenburg University in Sweden, who has been an architect for much of the work on sustainable development also at uh, Gothenburg University, but um, has pushed uh, for this topic to uh, scale up um, when it comes to the International Association of Universities. So I give you the floor, Pam, to uh, also introduce uh, the work of the IU and this link to UNEP. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, I could actually echo Sam, but I will uh, give some other words in more overview of the sustainable development goals. There's no uh, question that um, the uh, UN has clearly stated, and we know that the key role of higher education to reach the sustainable development goals and realize Agenda 2030. And for IAU perspective, we have engaged in higher education for sustainable development since the 90s as one of our prioritized areas. And also in 2018, we inaugurated a consortium of IAU members, the IAU cluster of higher education for sustainable development. And the aim of this is to have um, uh, cooperating a consortium cooperating to develop initiatives and to achieve the sustainable development goals. As we know that the sustainable development goals are all interconnected and they comprise the three pillars, economic, environmental, and social. And that includes in my perspectives, also the cultural perspectives. So what I would like is to highlight the uh, importance of the uh, social and cultural perspectives when developing and implementing new technology to reach the, the green economy. So for this, higher education must be acknowledged and supported and also responsible to provide research and education, not just in the STEM area, but also in humanity, in social sciences and in arts. The complexity of the challenges, as we're, you will discuss here, the green economy will require interdisciplinarity approaches and also cooperation, as was mentioned by Sam, cooperation with different stakeholders in societies, but also with politicians and policymakers. So higher education must provide students, and that is including also the lifelong learners, with skills to act, to take responsibility for sustainable societal transformation, including, of course, the green economy, and that means including this in all sectors of the job market and not just today and it also for tomorrow so it is important that we uh, have the skills in the students so they can be the future changing agents so finally i just would welcome the distinguished speakers and i'm eager to listen and see what will come out from this and i think it will be a very very good seminar welcome Thank you, Pam. Uh, great uh, introduction as well to this uh, very important topic and also how with IAU we've been able to already foster a lot of attention to this important role of higher education for sustainable development, but then to pick up on both some and your presentation to also see uh, the importance of higher education to rethink the way in which they contribute to this transformation that will lead us into a more sustainable future. So let's hear now from uh, Noemi Mete, who's the uh, ecosystems, who's from the ecosystems division, youth and education officer, higher education at UNEPA, um, who will uh, provide some further information on um, description of green careers and also um, green jobs and what kind of resources and strategies can be used. And we will then move to Deb Deborah Rowe, who is uh, a lead in HESI, the Higher Education for Sustainability Initiative, and as well the president of the US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. Um, and you will uh, discuss, um, Deborah, uh, some very useful materials again and opportunities for participants to pick up and to use uh, when uh, moving into the future. So, Noemi? Let me start by giving you the floor and Deborah comes next. 
Thank you very much, Eric J. Um, so I want to special thank to everyone to be here today in following this very important conversation around connecting higher education in the green economy community. A special thanks to the IAU as well on the collaboration for this event. Uh, we are very happy to be here today as UNEP to support uh, this agenda. Um, and I am very motivated to work on this green jobs initiative as I personally uh, didn't have the opportunity uh, when I was graduating from my business school to have any green tint uh, to my studies. And so I really think it's an important topic to develop um, now with the urgent um, climate change on the way. So um, if you could, Isabel, can you share the presentation? Sorry. Yes. For that. Thank you very much. So I will uh, dive in today talking about the Global Guidance for Education on Green Jobs documents that has been issued in September 2021 in collaboration with the US Partnership for Education and Sustainable Development and UNEPA working on it. After, so it came out after months and months of research and collection of best resources from multiple UN agencies and other partners. We really want to thank everyone for their collaboration on this. Um, this document is created uh, to give uh, readers uh, the tools to prepare right away the students to participate in this just transition to a green and a more inclusive economy. So that the students can apply this knowledge within their professions, but also within their adult roles uh, as consumers, voters, uh, community members, as well as investors. So the audience for this document is basically everyone, but it's mostly targeted to the higher education community, the other educators as well, the NGOs, the governments and employers, so that, and the youth organizations, of course, so that everyone can connect together to strategically plan and collaborate on this agenda. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to go through a few numbers so that we realize uh, the importance of this green transition. So today there are currently 200 million students enrolled in the higher education system and it will double by 2030. However, we still have unfortunately 71 million unemployed youth currently struggling to find a job. And this has been even worse with the COVID-19 pandemic. The good news is that uh, with this green economy underway, there are 60 million new jobs which will be created with the new climate policies and commitments also undertaken by different countries. Um, as the, so the UN, we really want to work on accelerate this green transition so that every country can benefit from the opportunities of green jobs, which are actually growing more quickly than other jobs globally. Next slide, please. Um, so I just wanted to dive in uh, the definition of a green job. So according to ILO, a green job is defined as a decent job, which contributes to preserve or restore the environment. And when we see decent is also a good pay. It's not a niche a topic. There's already big momentum already on the way. And I just want to show that it concerns any position because it's targeted for traditional sectors as well as non-traditional growing sectors, uh, such as renewable energy, and sometimes even unexisting sectors uh, that can be created with green entrepreneurship. Uh, it's also inclusive of all jobs, technicians, business managers, financiers, engineers, and it uh, can be local, I mean, country specific, depending on how the green transition is handled. So any job that includes choices from how to better utilize resources that are consumed can be green jobs. So what has LinkedIn showed uh, with the study, the taxonomy that they conducted with the economic graph, collecting around 800 green skill and analyzing how they were um, developed by their participants on their platform, uh, they saw that the job requesting green skills were actually more than the green talent that was actually present on the market. So the demand for workers with green skill has outpaced the growth in the supply of green talent. So this is very interesting and shows that there's a big work that is needed on skills assessment that is conducted by other actors such as IRENA, Solar Power Europe and PAGE with skills assessments uh, that all help us to understand the skill gap 
Um, this work on skill gap will be very uh, happy to share with the virtual community that we'll mention later on during this event. Um, but to come back on the work that's been conducted by LinkedIn, uh, they have shown with the work that there are many green skills that have seen double digit or even triple digit growth over the last three years uh, in traditional green carriers, but also in sectors that are not considered as green sectors. For instance, sustainable fashion and investment. What was interestingly shown by LinkedIn also is that the hiring rate for people with green skills is actually 1.5 faster than the people without. So the candidates with these green skills are being evaluated differently and are setting themselves apart. So more information will be shared by LinkedIn with a full report that will release on February 22nd. And I all invite you to uh, read this report when it comes out. A few other points I wanted to pinpoint was that there's need for cross-sector collaboration to move this agenda forward between educators, employers, and governments to fill the skill gap. Um, and UNEP wants to bring emphasis on the support they can bring to universities and technical colleges because they are institutions that have the ability to be forward-looking and they have the ability also to encourage partnerships to develop curricula adapt teacher skills uh, to link with businesses. And also they have this uh, ability to motivate and encourage the students to participate in the greening of their own school. Um, and I also wanted to emphasize on the role of data. As Sam mentioned, we collaborate with LinkedIn because we really think that they have a potential due to the data they detain and the skill they have. Uh, and they have this ability probably to forecast what are the future skills needed and what we need to respond to. For instance, for example, they were able to see that potentially by 2023, the number of jobs in renewable energy sector will outpace the number of jobs in oil and gas. Um, I wanted to emphasize also on the importance of inclusivity. We need to make sure that this transition, green job transition is just and inclusive and I wanted to emphasize on gender equality because um, there is still um, a misbalance in the unbalance because there is um, it's a fundamental requirement for meeting the sustainable development goals. And this needs to be tackled at early stage with girls uh, reaching higher education to, and to close the gap in STEM and clean energy and encourage scholarships also for girls. Um, it needs to be also inclusive for all youth, mobilize youth from all backgrounds. And I feel universities also have the role to influence on the whole community on the greening of the skills. Um, and support can be done between universities from different um, countries. Uh, and support to lower income countries needs to be done on this so that all, so this transition is inclusive of all youth. Next slide, please. So this, to come back to the global guidance documents, basically, I just wanted to leave you with three key components, uh, but I invite you to read, of course, the whole documents for higher education institutions of all, type, all types to help students to reach the academic and professional potential. So we'd like to focus on knowledge enhancement, skills and competency development and job opportunities. So the actions within these three areas are essential to accelerate the green transition and prevent the current large scale human suffering due to climate instability, the ecosystem degradation and economic disruptions. The virtual community that Deborah will detail more about, we invite you to join because this will be the way for us to make this event go further and to bring this conversation further so that we all make this agenda move forward. Next slide, please. So to conclude uh, on this agenda, I think uh, there's all need for adaptability and flexibility for the development of green jobs. Uh, we need to anticipate future needs and changes. Um, with COVID-19, we've seen that we have this adaptability and flexibility capacity for quick changes. So this is what we need to do for the green jobs agenda. It won't be easy, uh, it's not easy, um, because it needs, it's, it need, all actors need to be involved in this. It is difficult to know how to adapt to every different uh, local context. 
everybody needs to drive change. Um, and I would like to finish on three key messages. Um, so UNEP is here to support you. Uh, we are here also to try and bring this agenda forward within the UN. We're trying to build uh, forces together, workforce together. Um, and we, on, for university and technical colleges, we are happy to take the opportunity with this event to engage further the discussion so that you take action on this agenda. For recruiters, uh, such as in LinkedIn also, and employers, uh, we think that it's important to top up the capabilities and engage with the governments, use the data also to give some key takeaways and pathways to act. And for students and youth, uh, that will be very happy to hear later, they are the engine for change and they will be there, they need to drive the demand. And um, so we're very happy to bring this agenda forward and to collaborate uh, with all the actors on this. Thank you very much. Wonderful, uh, Noemi Mete, thank you so much for this uh, very comprehensive presentation. Very good that there is a recording because it's so rich uh, that people also will wish to see it again. And we will also share probably the, uh, the PowerPoint so that people can read through it again. People already asked for uh, further information. Uh, you will receive a lot of information along the way, but also after the, um, the webinar itself. And uh, we invite you to join uh, this community of practice that UNAPA is, uh, is developing because that will be the real opportunity for you to participate in this change agenda uh, for the future. Deborah, I'm very pleased to turn to you um, uh, as um, HESI uh, um, representative, you're doing a lot on that front, but also as president again, as I said earlier, of the US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. Um, and you take us from the US to the world, actually. So um, it is really to exchange uh, a lot on the practices. And that's where the community will set in as well. But I leave you the floor so that you can explain that uh, to the audience. The floor is yours. Thank you. I am so glad to be here and to be able to uh, address this very important topic. So. Um, yeah, I've spent over 40 years teaching this in both the TVET setting and the university setting. And it is really time for us to create the solutions that we need and build this green economy. I know many of you have been working on it for a long time. I acknowledge your great work. Uh, we have more to do. So let's get started today. What I'm going to talk about are the collaborators that are working on this initiative, the components of the Green Jobs Initiative the environmental need, it's obvious, but I'll just say a couple of things about that and the imperative to build this green economy for the climate solutions we need and really for all of the SDGs. But our first focus um, in the first part of the green economy is going to be on clean energy employers needs. And then we will be addressing the other sectors of the green economy as well. You'll hear about that. And then uh, areas for improvement where all of us can take action and our next steps. So those are my topics today. Let's get started. So here's the collaborators. Actually, we couldn't fit all their logos on here. So this is just some of them. Um, and you can see that it's a wonderful group who are working together to move beyond the reports that say, oh, there's gonna be a lot of green jobs to the specifics of how we prepare people for those green jobs and help the companies who are growing our green economy um, streamline their efforts to get the workforce they need so that we can build the solutions. There were lots of contributors to the guidance document that we created. And I, I know it looks like an alphabet soup, but when you go into the guidance document and we'll put the link to the um, global guidance document in the chat right now, so you can see it, um, you'll be able to read about the specifics of the UN agencies, places like the experts in the World Bank and other uh, organizations that had experts that we asked to contribute to this document. So what we did is we kind of created a one-stop shop for you. It took us about a year and a half to put together this guidance document. And um, it's good we had all those collaborators, but the truth is everybody on today's call is also a collaborator. We cannot do this without you. So, you know, I don't want another document that sits on the shelf, right? Let's get these things implemented. Many of you have already introduced yourself in the chat. We wanna know who you are because you are the collaborators with us. 
Um, but if you haven't yet, or if you forgot to give your role in your organization, if you're connected to one, please do so. Because not only do we want to know you, but we want you to know each other so that you'll be able to support each other in creating these solutions. And there's, there's no reason to be redundant in our efforts, right? Let's share the solutions we're creating. Okay, here are the components of the Green Jobs Initiative. First, this global guidance document. It's got 85 resources in it. So it, it really is a great start. It gives a framework and the resources. Then we're having these stakeholder convenings. So today is the educators, the trainers. We've got ministers on here. We've got NGOs. Um, lovely to see TVETs and universities on the same call in the same meeting. Then uh, in a couple of weeks, we're going to start to convene the employers. You'll hear about that. Also the recruiters. And the recruiters, not only um, for students and for the employees, but also special recruiters that make sure we get the women and the disadvantaged communities recruited into this growing green economy. And then also the funders and the policymakers, because we want to make sure the program designs make sense. We need to understand the challenges and design the solutions. We're well on our way with that, but there's much more to be done and to do it together. And then to be able to implement those solutions so that we can improve, what is it that we want to improve? We want to improve our curricula. We want to improve our career guidance. We want to improve internships and job placement processes. And we need to improve our research to make it more aligned with the challenges of growing the green economy. And we can do that. So we have tools for all of those we'll share with you. Um, and we look forward to your uh, ongoing engagement. We also want to create improvements for ongoing communication. This can't be like a snapshot. Oh, 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 a great event. Oh, we have this information. And then we think it's done. There were going to be emerging skill sets, emerging need for all of those items in number four. We need to be able to communicate effectively with the green economy employers and tertiary education. I know higher education is a tough word. Just let me explain who we need. It's not just graduate students it's universities, it's TVETs, it's and technical colleges. And it's also kind of spills over into the high school a little bit, right? Where you're teaching some of these skills that are needed for the green economy. Okay, what are the outcomes of the Green Jobs Initiative? Ah, well, the outcomes are gonna be better curricula, right? Because we're gonna make those efforts to change it. And I know what it's like trying to change curricula. So I thank you ahead of time for making those efforts. We're going to have improved employee skills so that the companies don't have those skills gaps that hold them back. We're going to have better employee recruitment and job placements. And we're going to have research that helps to strengthen the transition to a green economy. We're also going to have improved and ongoing communication processes between the employers and the educators, because right now it's it's glitchy in many areas and it needs to be refined. It needs to be streamlined. Okay, so we have activities going on and activities to support you that are coming up. Today's event, of course, we're so glad you're here or if you're listening to it on the recording. On February 23rd, REN21 is co-convening with us, the clean energy companies. They are gonna share their workforce challenges and we are gonna have events like this for the different parts of the green economy. What are they going to talk about the clean energy companies? Skills gaps and suggestions for curricular updates and related research. They're gonna talk about cha their challenges they're finding with getting interns and recruiting employees and job placement. And they're gonna suggest process improvements that are needed for the TVETs and the university in interactions with industry. So if you wanna attend, and we'll give you the link later, you can, but this, the purpose of this event is to listen to them. And then we're gonna have a follow-up survey that the International Renewable Energy Agency has put together that will get more refined, uh, more data specific on those skill gaps in this part of the green economy. You already heard about the LinkedIn report as well. There's others coming out um, and we'll be sharing all of those with you. And then we're gonna go into solution summits where the universities, the TVETs and the employers can come together and refine what's happening so that it's better. And those will be great events to be a part of. And we want, look, I don't waste time in meetings. So we will not waste time in these solution summits. 
So I know your time is precious. We respect that, but we also need to create the solutions together. And then because this can't be a one-time event, it can't be a snapshot, we're creating a virtual community where you'll receive this key information on an ongoing basis. You'll be able to share solutions, reduce your implementation barriers, provide peer support and mentoring. You'll have an education and industry forum for communication and ongoing improvements. We'll talk more about that virtual community in a little bit. So I don't need to tell you this. We all know this. We are in a crisis, a code red for humanity and the planet. And this is our last chance. We need immediate, rapid, and large-scale reductions in greenhouse gases to limit climate change. The studies show many negative impacts. I can't go through all of them, and you probably already know them. But I do want to point out just the most recent Princeton University uh, study that only looked at heat and humidity, which is only one of the items we will deal with as we um, get more of the climate change impacts, and they're happening now. We're going to see massive human suffering from this heat and humidity problem. Over 3 billion lives are at risk for either death or displacement. They literally won't be able to spend time outside where they're living. And 80% of the planet's population has already been impacted by climate change. So we have to act like we're in a crisis, which means we've got to change what we do in our daily jobs. The good news is, is that we have the solutions. My expertise happens to be in renewable energies. I taught renewables for over 42 years and owned a company that was wholesale and retail. But I also have the scientific expertise. You all have seen it, I hope, right? The solutions are available. They're already cost-effective to meet our 2030 um, scientific mandate. We have to double renewable energies by then and triple by 2050. We have to get to net zero. We need to create a resilient energy economy dominated by renewables and energy efficiency. And it's happening, but it's not happening fast enough. So we will have these jobs. We have them now at a pace that, that is faster in its demand than what we are providing in students, but we've got to take bold actions now, not just in training for the renewable energy jobs, but for all of the jobs in the green economy and all of the actions that are required. So let's, let's move forward with those bold actions. Once again, thank you to those of you who have changed your daily lives and you are working on those actions now. So what's the problem? Well, in the clean energy space, these companies are our climate heroes, but these companies are so busy implementing the energy systems that we need to try to stabilize the climate that they don't have time. They don't, and they need to help us reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% in the next eight years. There are thousands of technical institutions and universities and tertiary education. The companies just don't have the time to connect with each institution about what they need in terms of curricula skills and improved job placement processes. So we are streamlining this for them so that we can tell all of you and we can share with each other Universities and TVETs can help provide the necessary workforce. It's a crucial and a wonderful opportunity. And I've just got to acknowledge TVETs. I don't know, I think it was 13 years ago, I was traveling around the world and working with different TVET systems and helping them engage in creating the technicians that we need and integrating sustainability into all of their different programs. But you know that we need more of that as well, even though TVETs have done a lot. Also, TVETs are recognizing that we have to expand to not just teaching technicians, but also the salespeople, because they grow the businesses. And TVETs, many of them utilize the advisory committees from their, you know, talking to their local companies just as part of their structure. But who else can contribute? Who else has to act? Ministries of education. And what can they do? Well, a lot of things, but very importantly, engage all of their post high school educational institutions in this. And thank you to the ministries and the staff that are on the call today and are listening to this. Leadership in the universities and the TVETs, and leadership doesn't have to come from the top. It helps if it does, but you can have champions from throughout the institution. I've seen that over and over. Curricular decision makers and educators 
Some countries, you have a commission that decides the curricula for the whole country. Other places, it's just your own department. But whoever makes those decisions, they need to act. And then career centers, department and program employees. Well, it's obvious career centers, right? But the department and program employees oftentimes have impact as it relates to internships, as it relates to job placement processes, as it relates to career guidance. So all of them need to be involved, not only to improve it, but to streamline it. I'll explain more about that in a little bit. We know that renewable energy is not an academic discipline. I run a network of 45 academic societies and energy isn't one of them. There is an emerging and promising trend to have degrees and courses and certificates in energy efficiency and renewable energy. But now is the time to start these programs if you haven't and to take the future needs of clean energy companies into account. And as I talk about clean energy today, Think about that's also sustainable forestry and it's sustainable agriculture. It's all the different parts of the green economy that we lay out in the global guidance document. We need better job placements. We'll have more satisfied students if they can easily connect and work with these companies. And we can take advantage of this inevitable clean energy and green economy transition to grow your institution so there are examples of this. I'm not gonna go into the specifics. And there, if you look, they're not just talking about technicians here, right? We had an event with the World Bank a year ago and we had uh, companies come on and say, look, I need accountants. I need financiers. I need project managers. This has gotta come from the university level. So please dig into this and more. University departments, Oftentimes the business school has integrated sustainability and green economy. Sometimes it's just that abstract sustainability. So we need to get down to the practical skill development around the green economy. Business schools and engineering schools have tended to make the changes, but each academic area has a unique and important role to play. And in the network that I run, we have like pages of examples of how to introduce this into your curricula, um, whether you teach English or graphic arts or psychology. So in the virtual community, we will share those resources with you at, so that you can see, and one of the things we hear is, I have so much to teach, I don't have room to put anything else in. We show how you can teach what you need to teach anyway and be integrating in green economy skills and perspectives and competencies. I'll give you just one example. You're teaching psychology, you're teaching operant and classical conditioning. Why not make your examples around changing behaviors in terms of energy waste? Graphic arts. Okay, I'll give you another example. Graphic arts, you can be the ones in your classes to create the visuals that we need for the social media and other forms of education that the communities need. And your English students can write the materials for community um, energy and green economy education. You wanna see students get excited, let them work on assignments like that. So we actually have websites that we put together that can help you projects for good, research for good, placements for good uh, um, that are international. So there are areas for improvement at both the national level and the institutional level, not just in the department and academic discipline area. Uh, we need more information about the types of jobs. Once again, there tends to be this stereotyping that it's about technicians and engineers. I have 17 pages of green jobs that I presented as uh, when I did a speech at the National Science Foundation like 10, 10 years ago. And uh, the list of green jobs has only grown. We do have to make an effort to be more inclusive. Um, we need to show that the job opportunities and provide the role models that will recruit women and also people from disadvantaged groups. We may have some work to do and universities, we have expertise at, at diversity and inclusion on how to shift the cultures in some of the companies so that they're more welcoming to these groups. Uh, we need professional development for educators, of course. We'll be sharing some of that through the virtual community. And the pedagogy, may I suggest that your students will build the skills better if they work on real world projects. 
and that they need to be able to practice change agent skills and green economy competency. So let me just give you one example. When I use, I've taught energy management for 40, 40 some years. I know I really am that old. And when I would teach energy management, students would go out and do energy audits in community buildings. I could have given them a theoretical one building and I had my key. It took a little more time to correct the energy audits because they were on real buildings, but it changed the student's sense of who they are in the world and the contributions that they can make. That's just one of so many examples of how we can use real world projects to increase motivation in the students to be change agents for a green economy. So competencies, Look, we need more education about these competencies. And there is a rich journal literature on learning outcomes and competencies around sustainability that of course includes the green economy on specific jobs and on change, how to be a change agent. Change agent skills include being able to, and this is just a, a, I could spend a lot of time on this, but just a taste. Change agents need to understand the informal and formal power structure of the organization that they're working in. They need to be able to identify leverage points to change the system, because we can't do small changes. We don't have time for that. We need to do systems change. They need to be able to be a champion for the transition and not irritating in their passion and commitment, but effective in making change with their commitment. And they need to be able to build coalitions to support the systemic change. So these are all change agent skills that we can help teach. And of course, they need to be problem solvers. But you want them to have the personal management skills and the interpersonal skills so they won't burn out so that they will be effective for a long time as a change agent. Now, this is an article, one of my favorites, on what are the key competencies that we need to help students be those change agents and to be effective in growing the green economy. Um, I actually went to the publisher and asked them to open up this article uh, and make it free because it was behind a paywall. So for the next month, this is free. And Evie, thank you, is gonna put this into the chat right now, the link to this article. So I strongly recommend you go take a look. Uh, it's not just one article, right? It's a, this stream of literature, but I think it's um, summarized well in this article that we need to teach not just the specific skills for the green jobs, but also systems thinking, how to envision a positive future that's a sustainable future, normative and values thinking, how do we shift the norms in our society? of course, to be strategic thinkers and to be able to have those collaborative skills and the problem solving skills. So uh, enjoy the article um, and thank you to the publisher for opening that up just for a month though, so go get it. Um, we also need more streamlined communication processes between our vocational training, our universities and our companies. So um, I used to run the Detroit Green Skills Alliance and we had nonprofits and government and businesses all coming together to grow the green economy. And when we reached out to work with students as interns or to hire them, every department in the universities had a separate form and a separate website for internships and to reach out to the students for job placements. And if we went to the career center, the students weren't connected to the career center, we had to get to each of the faculty. It was incredibly cumbersome for us as a Green Skills Alliance, as a collaboration of companies and NGOs. We can't fix that from the company side. Universities and TVETs have to fix that and make it easy to have like a single portals that'll then go out to all these departments. So if anybody's got a good model for that, please let us know because we wanna replicate that. It's been a real problem. We also need to improve the process for curricular input and to be, quicker in changing our curricula, updating our curricula. So I know a lot of you've been working on this already. We wanna know what you're already doing to improve how educators prepare students to be the workforce for the clean energy transition and the green economy. If you've got some great examples, would you please put them in the chat now? That would be wonderful. If you're listening to the recording, come to the virtual community where we can share it. And we will, we're having a repository built of these things and highlighting promising practices. 
and then include any related links when you put it into the chat so that we can go and get more information on that. And of course, we'll have your information. We may reach out to you individually or please come to the virtual community. While you are filling that in, just because in the interest of time, we've got a lot of great speakers today, I'm going to continue. But if you have questions about any of this, put your questions into the Q&A part. It'll be easier to see than if it's in the very long chat, which we will be saving, by the way. I want to tell you about something else that supports this. Out of HESI, the Higher Ed Sustainability Initiative, which is multiple UN agencies and NGOs and higher ed networks for sustainability. We also have not just this green jobs initiative work group, but we also have um, support for the SDG publishers compact. We have a fellows program. And uh, what they are doing is aligning research and educational materials with the sustainable development goals. Now, this SDG publishers compact was created not only by the publications office at the United Nations, but by the International Publishers Association. These are the people who publish the research journals. And so having the editors source or have themes um, around what we need to do to build the green economy will really make a difference. Let's make this research useful. Let's listen to the companies and hear what they need in terms of research. And then let's go do that. So we have that piece and it's very exciting. Look, we've got a lot of good news here. We have the global guidance document. It has the framework. It's got 85 resources. It also connects you to groups that can assist you. IRENA and REN21 are collecting information for you from this first part of the green economy, the very crucial clean energy transition, but then also we'll be doing this with the other sectors of the green economy. And we have the virtual support, excuse me, the virtual community that will support you as you move forward in your actions. So right now, Evie is putting the link into the chat. Thank you, Evie. Um, so that you can sign up for that virtual community. It's got all sorts of benefits for you, as you can see listed here, but let me be more specific. You'll be able to learn with others. You'll have curricular updates for all academic areas. Some we already have, some you'll share. I'm sure there's a lot of good work going on in here, but we already have a lot to start. And then we're gonna be organizing the solution summits out of there with the employers and the voc tech organizations and the universities. And we're gonna improve the communications with employers through this virtual community. And we'll be sharing best practices, as I've said, change strategies, like you've got somebody in your way in the hierarchy in your organization. Other people have had that too. How do we deal with those barriers? And then opportunities for, opportunities for peer support and mentoring. It'll also help you collaborate with other institutions and curricular designers and government agencies. And you, we, you, we are creating a career advising improvement initiative. So you'll have access to those materials. Look, even if you can't participate in the community for some reason, fill out the virtual community form to get this information that you can use. Benefits for you. Of course, it'll be a career builder for some of you. Some of us are careers like already built enough already. But for many of you, you are building that career and we want to help you build it. We, you'll get more positive reactions from students. You'll be appreciated not only within academia, but also outside of academia. And it's gonna help with your publishing and your research, if that's what you do. You'll also feel great because you're doing the right thing, being a part of this. So what are your next steps? Join the virtual community. And there is gonna be, um, we're doing a separate thing with um, a ministerial staff from employment and clean energy and education. So uh, just so you know, that's gonna be going on too. You may share other contacts in this forum for other people in your organization, uh, that's optional. Of course, read and use the global guidance document. It's a one-stop source and it's got all these vetted resources. If you are a government organization or some other organization like a university that can convene, um, 
you can consider doing a national level follow-up of this. And so we can help you to get the speakers that you need so you can make this happen in your country and connect to the virtual community so you can share and learn from other countries. Now on February 23rd, we are hosting this rendezvous event while co-hosting with REN21. They're really running the event. And there's the link to register for it. And the companies will be talking about their skills gaps and suggestions for curricular updates, their challenges with recruitment and job placement and improvement ideas for how they interact with educators. If you come, please in the breakout groups, listen. Don't talk about what you're doing as much as just listen to them so we can gather that information. And then we'll have opportunities after that in the solution summits for you to share with the employers. That's where you register for the event. So right now we're putting these key links into the chat for you. So you'll have access to all of them. I know that you're already busy and that you may feel like you're not the expert at this. But to make positive change, we all have to get comfortable with being outside of our comfort zone. You don't have to know the answers. Just facilitate the process and please make it inclusive of others. You have a very important role to play. We can't do this without you. So I want to say, if you need to get a hold of me, that's my email. But I want to say congratulations for all that you've already done, but even more so congratulations for what you're going to do in the future. And now we have this wonderful roundtable of respondents to share their views from the youth, employers, and higher education sectors. And I want to start with Jada Sola. So Jada Sola Iyuwu is from the University of Lagos in Nigeria. She's a Millennium Fellow. She also works with the US Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development. Uh, if you are from an African country, she probably was the one who did helped us do the marketing out to you so you could be here today. So Jada Sola, your thoughts? You need to unmute yourself, Jada Sola. Uh, it's an honor to be a part of this event, and I've been looking forward to this for a very long time. And I think it's very important for us to adopt sustainability in our everyday lives. And I believe what UNEP and the United States Partnership for Education is doing with the Global Guardian Settlement is going to go a long way in achieving a healthier and sustainable environment. And we need education and training for green energy jobs. And a lot of students like me know little to nothing about green economy jobs or even that there's a green sector. I, I believe an updated curriculum is going to keep us informed, not just about opportunities, but also improvements that have been made in the green economy so that students can bring more innovative ideas to the green sector. And also, career guidance will go a long way in helping us as students make the right decisions so what career path would be best for us in the industry? Jay DeSola, can you talk a little louder? Can you talk a little louder? I think it'll be easier okay. and maybe turn down the volume on the computer because we're getting some. Oh, sorry about that. Just talk louder. Um, I think that'll help. We, we need an updated curricula to keep us informed about not just opportunities, but also improvements being made in the green sector so that students, us as students, can bring more innovative ideas to the green sector. Career guidance is also going to go a long way in helping our students make the right decisions as to what career path would be best for us in the industry. Uh, the information in the global guidance document is very enlightening and it needs to be adopted by all institutions. The document is going to help young people outside of school, not just for employment purposes, but also to better educate the public about having a clean and green lifestyle. We also need more trainings on how to be better equipped for green jobs so we can help create more green jobs and help grow the industry. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And next we have Amanda Lang Salvia. She's a research associate at the Green Office at the University of Paso Fundo. And if you haven't read her publications, she's got many of them. Wonderful to have you with us representing the Young Adult Voice. 
please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity of being a respondent today. And it was also a pleasure to be part of the team of reviewers of the Global Guidance. I'd like to start by congratulating the authors of this incredible document and organizers of this Green Jobs Initiative and this event. Uh, the Global Guidance is for sure a useful resource for teaching staff, students, green employers, career advising centers, and all those uh, interested in or working with sustainability, green economy, green jobs, the role of education. So we can see that the scope of it and uh, the groups involved represent a wide international community. And it's also nice to see that the, the, the global guidance is also available in Spanish and Chinese. So it extends uh, its impact and, and coverage. This, this, is, this is very nice. Uh, I'd like to quickly acknowledge two main points covered by the guidance. First, the need for education and training for green economy jobs. We see that the market is changing, is evolving. So we need the curriculum, teaching, research, outreach to reflect that so that the students can be more prepared for these opportunities and for everything that is out there. Uh, second, the fact that education institutions should not only revise their curricula, but they should also offer uh, better opportunities and, and better support to students in terms of career advising and opportunities for green jobs. For example, at the green office at my university, uh, which is kind of our sustainability office, we, uh, we have an important plan for this year, which is develop a database for opportunities on internships in companies working towards green economy and sustainability. So for us, this is a, a very important initiative because the students need this connection uh, educators need the feedback uh, from this relationship. And we can also collect inputs from employers in terms of what is needed uh, for revising their curriculum. So this is a, a great uh, opportunity for us as well to be involved with green economy, green jobs. And uh, well, as a sustainability and climate change researcher, and especially as an environmental engineer, who sees the gap between the training generally received and the market opportunities. Uh, I'm really excited to see this initiative, this movement, and I hope to see and be part of future developments. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you very much. And thanks for all the work you've done. Um, so next uh, we're gonna hear from Daniel. Daniel was, I think that I, made him up in my wish list, but then he actually existed in reality. He's doing amazing work as Director of Business Development at Solar Power Europe. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you, Deborah, for the invitation. I'm very excited to be participating in, in this event. Uh, maybe I can start with a quick word on Solar Power Europe and who we are. We are essentially the European uh, Solar Industry uh, Association. We represent over 260 organizations active across the entire solar value chain. So that includes companies, research organizations, national associations. And our job is really to shape the regulatory environment and make sure that there are opportunities for solar uh, in, in the energy system. Really, really want to champion solar as a key technology in this energy transition. Now, we all know that we are facing perhaps the biggest challenge of our generation. This is uh, climate change. And we believe in Solar Power Europe that we have a fighting chance only if we have the right people uh, with the right skills helping us in this fight. In fact, being so close with the companies, uh, we actually had exact same feedback from them. And, and this is that we need to find the right people with the right skills and we need them fast and we need them in the masses. 
Now, because we, we are also very close to the industry, we don't just like talking about it. Uh, we like taking actions and want to, we want to put things in practice. And therefore, we started a very, very ambitious project that I want to share with you. So if you go on the next slide, uh, the idea that we have is to develop a solar workforce platform that connects, uh, on one hand, job seekers with the companies providing jobs in solar, but at the same time to bring into the mix uh, the third major stakeholder in the equation. And this is the training providers and the education providers, the academia. Now, with this being said, uh, we are working closely with the companies that we represent to create a solar skills list from which the, the job seekers can choose from to create profiles. And at the same time, companies basically can create uh, potential jobs and create ads for those jobs through exact same solar skills list. Now we want an algorithm to be able to match the profiles of those job seekers with the companies providing jobs, but at the same time to highlight, as we call them, the solar skills list gaps and to basically push forward potential trainings, potential educational programs that can actually fill some of those gaps. So we, we really want to bridge basically the gap between the three major stakeholders, the job seekers, uh, the jobs providers, and the education providers. Now, although we believe this is a very good first step forward, we cannot do this alone. And I want to echo some of the, uh, some of, uh, some of the statements from the other speakers earlier today, that we need to update the curricula as soon as possible. And we need to do that in, in multiple disciplines, in multiple programs. In fact, companies are not just looking for, for people with technical skills. They also need accountants. They also need marketeers. They need people working in economics. They need psychologists. They basically need people with, uh, uh, with different backgrounds, with various skills. And we can only do that if we have the right curricula. But in addition to this, we need to streamline the processes when it comes to communication uh, with institutions. And, and we need better career guidance uh, uh, in, for that instance. Uh, we need to ensure that we have the right responses, the, not, the right connections with the students to ensure that we fill those gaps. Because in reality, we believe that uh, the, the growth potential is inevitable. But at the same time, one of the biggest challenges would be to have enough people to fill the jobs that will be created uh, with people that have the right skills. We are very much looking forward to... So, uh, Daniel, sorry, I think uh, we didn't go to the next slide, but just let me know and we'll share them later. So apologies for that. No problem at all. Yes. I, I think now, now we can see the slide. Uh, uh, I mean, I participated in many, many events. So I'm sure that the slides are just, uh, just a nice backup. But in reality, I think it's more important what we say uh, in, in the presentations. So... Uh, thank you so much for for listening. We are we are actively looking for partners, and if you if you want to work with us on this exciting project, feel free to reach out to me. I just want to thank also Deborah because we are collaborating together, and we're making this platform an opportunity also for uh, for placing uh, uh, global jobs and looking for people all around the world, not just in Europe, which was a, a big step forward for us. So thank you, Deborah, for the collaboration. And, and as mentioned previously, we cannot do this alone. So we are actively looking for more partners and, and we want obviously to, uh, to have a fighting chance in this uh, global climate crisis. Thank you very much and looking forward to, to discussing with you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we could show the next slide of Daniel just so that they've got the um, contact information from him too. Um, that would be great. There you go. There, so it, there is, it is, yes. Yeah. Sorry about that. Thank I was you. really waiting for the next slide there, um, but we will share them in the end as well. So everyone will have them. Great. Yeah, so Daniel will be, will be coming into the virtual community as well and telling us how we can work with him, which is wonderful. And just thank you for your great work um, and making this a uh, global effort. Um, of course, we need to do it in all the other clean energy spaces. So uh, the wind and the biomass and the energy efficiency, et cetera, and in the different parts of the green economy. So it's a model that we're looking to replicate. Um, next, I'm very pleased to say we've got Saranjana Kosh, and she is the Global Director of Partnerships and Campaigns at Power for All. 
Saranjana. Thank you so much, Debra. And it's wonderful to be here and to listen to these amazing points of view and work that's being done on this platform. Uh, so I'd like to take a quick moment to thank uh, UNEP and the, International and the International Association of Universities uh, for this opportunity to speak on behalf of Powerful All. We are uh, very honored to be here. Uh, we can move to the next slide, please, Isabel. Thank you. So Power for All is a global campaign of you know, more than 200 partners uh, and where we work on advancing renewable decentralized uh, electrification as the fastest, most cost effective and uh, sustainable um, way to accelerate energy access in Asia and in Africa. Um, and to begin with you know, telling you why the work is so relevant that we're involved in, I'd like to talk about two sides um, of a coin. And one would be in terms of employment and the other would be in terms of energy access. And given the scenario of uh, the pandemic and in the wake of the pandemic, we know that uh, the unemployment rates across different sectors have really suffered. And so we see rising unemployment, we see, but yet there is demand for energy. And this is exactly where our work is very relevant. And um, to share a statistic, about 13% of the world still lives without access to reliable energy, and which in itself is a massive opportunity um, for Power for All and the work that we do to be able to mobilize different stakeholders, communities of action to work on decentralized renewable energy through our task forces, through our various campaigns, whether that's empowering jobs, whether that's empowering health, and as well as the utilities 2.0. Um, so when we talk about solving energy poverty, it's not, it's not just a technical or a technological issue, but it is also an approach where if we were to involve the usual business as usual approaches, um, we see that uh, DRE solutions are actually able to uh, afford enough and more energy as compared to the utilities uh, that already exist. However, some of the challenges are, you know, things like um, final mile delivery or um, adoption at scale or financing. And all of this needs human capital to make or break um, SDG 7. And that's exactly where, um, again, um, the point on livelihoods and the point on creating a human capacity pipeline becomes extremely important. So Power for All is building momentum for a coordinated global effort to develop DRE-specific human capital for the DRE sector. And capacity building, again, just to quote um, what Daniel also mentioned, is actually a workforce development for DRE, which is not just about the DRE value chain, but it's broader uh, within the ecosystem, whether that's in terms of banks, or whether that's in terms of marketing jobs, or sales jobs, or financing, or advocates, or lawyers. So the impact potential of jobs across the different touch points is really enormous. And this entire value chain is projected to create something close to about 4.5 million jobs globally by 2030. Now, many of the jobs in renewable energy are actually not in the countries that suffer from low energy access. And once again, that actually highlights the huge opportunity to be able to match the potential for jobs, again, with uh, a skilled human capacity pipeline. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So that brings me to Power for All's Powering Jobs campaign. Um, this is um, our campaign, which is uh, based on the Energy Access Workforce uh, report that we come out in 2019. And at that point in time, it was focused on three countries, uh, India, Nigeria, and Kenya. And right now it straddles two more countries. We're working on the 2021 version of this um, report right now, and it will be also covering Uganda and uh, Ethiopia. Now this speaks about the status of DRE job creation in the sector. It speaks about the status of what's happened to jobs in the sector in a post pandemic era. It also talks about the resilience of the sector. Are we seeing um, you know, more jobs actually being generated? Are we seeing a degrowth in jobs? And um, our initial reports, while we're still in the process of data collection, shows us very encouraging reports that this is actually a very resilient sector. There is a massive potential for jobs, and it actually is just about making those connections uh, for where the jobs actually lie with skilled workforce. And um, while we see that the impact of COVID has increased unemployment, but the jobs in DRE can actually achieve twofold goals. One is the electrification and jobs creation by capacity building. So we see that the DRE sector is actually emerging as a significant employer. And although nascent, it already has grown a workforce that's comparable to traditional utility uh, scale power sectors. And um, moving on, our Powering Jobs uh, report actually provides rich insights and a very true picture of what's happening on ground with a specific country context for each of these five country, countries that are within our uh, survey. And it's aimed at major players in the DRE sector among the value chain, focusing on 
uh, actual direct and indirect employment figures by skill level, by gender, because there's a massive opportunity again in the sector to create gender equity. And we will be take, taking a, a look at jobs across the spectrum into, um, into uh, salaries, into recruitment, into training. And so in terms of what we recommend, and if you can move to the last slide, please. We're recommending stronger industry collaboration, something that we're seeing uh, you know, each of uh, my other speakers over here also mentioned. So we're talking about uh, well-functioning, visible recruitment channels. How many institutions actually offer courses in renewable energy or in decentralized renewable energy? How many career days? How many industry fairs actually center around this? And Power for All would be really eager to work with TVETs, with, ed with educational institutions, actually share Powering jobs recommendations in one of the future solutions summit working with Deborah on that hopefully and uh, we'd be very very eager to work uh, with you know with researchers with students to be able to create a body of evidence that actually drives more action uh, towards work uh, towards decent jobs among the youth and we do want to leave um, everybody with this one thought which is that we don't want the youth to default to traditional or conventional fossil fuel options, but to actually look at decentralized renewable energy as the first option. And for that, we need this very well functioning um, synergy between industry and um, educational institutions where curriculum can then be adapted to match the needs of the uh, sector and the market. Thank you very much. So, you know, we could do a whole session just from her, right? to really understand those needs and to be able to respond as the educational system. Thank you so much. And we do look forward to working with you in the virtual community and the solution summits. Um, I just wanna mention, cause it keeps, I keep seeing it come up. Yes, we do need to work with recent graduates and there isn't a good structure for that. And we do have a fellows program. They're all pro bono volunteers who wanna go beyond their local work. So if you are interested in helping, to, helping with that, reach out to me. And we are glad to talk with you about how can we support the graduates so that they don't feel so isolated in their searches for these green careers. Um, and then um, I also want to move on to our higher ed groups. Um, so first we have Ilva. Ilva Narain Bretzer is associate professor and senior lecturer at the School of Public Administration at the University of Gothenburg. Yes, thank you very much for your invitation and congratulations for having organized such an uh, exciting, important, timely conference on this uh, global green jobs topic. Um, I was uh, pretty much a climate activist in my student years, that seems to be a quarter of a century ago, time flies. Uh, but here I am today uh, doing research and teaching uh, on a day-to-day -day basis in public administration. Um, and yes, let's move to the next slide. Oh, there, yes. Um, uh, and there's very many topics that I can't agree more on, uh, that it is so important uh, that we talk about and deal with. And for example, this is a picture from a, a mid-sized town a bit uh, up north from uh, Gothenburg uh, in Sweden, on the west coast, Uddevalla. And uh, once in a while, uh, the city is flooded. And this is quite clearly a, um, a result of the uh, climate situation. Um, I shall not go into detail here, but uh, for my students, when I talk about uh, this picture, how many different types of disciplines or problems that uh, are connected here, it's planning, it's social, it's economic, investments, uh, it's technological, everything goes in one, one picture. So we definitely need to uh, both work together and collaborate and discuss the solutions on a broad level. Uh, but nevertheless, at the same time, be very respectful to the uh, 
individual disciplines which are experts in one one by one in uh, different angles or sub problems but we also need to connect the sub topics to the overarching situation uh, also uh, having been in science and academia for uh, about 25 years it's fascinating how much knowledge that have evolved just the past two three decades and uh, now we have knowledge about the ecological footprints about planetary boundaries about the 17 sdgs etc but still i experience very much that this is not necessarily a language that is commonplace among my colleagues in academia and when I meet the students that come to me it's not even common knowledge among them uh, among those so there's definitely a job to do here on the inside but also to the outside to the wider society uh, we need to work on the methods that we have on the table and also take the consequences and apply these in various ways, as someone mentioned before, uh, uh, um, apply to local circumstances in each and every place and situation. And next slide. So there's a lot of challenges that we have ahead of us or, or, or that we are in the middle of. Um, we need to um, take care of all our students that are coming to us and take that responsibility uh, for real and uh, help them to evolve into these agents of change, but also that we must lead and support uh, all of these persons, because it's not e easy to go out there and find the green jobs. And uh, one of the most common questions that I receive from this, uh, our students is, how do I get a job in the green sector coming from this uh, program? So that is definitely a pedagogical kind of task and challenge that we uh, as academics need to deal with. And also, even if we work, try to build more extensively networks with the alumni uh, group, et cetera, et cetera, it is really hard to match the present students together with the alumni uh, people. Uh, maybe, yeah, two or three percent will match and connect. But uh, for the rest, it's really tricky. So all different kinds of lessons, how do we uh, escalate that uh, would be most welcomed. And just to round up here, um, I, I think it's been a lot of talk uh, on technological solutions and, and uh, um, issues uh, or, or solutions that are out there that needs to be implemented etc cetera, etc cetera. Uh, i think it, again very much we need to uh, move together with economists with social scientists uh, leave no one behind because there's huge gaps growing out there both both financially but also technological or techn technology wise so we, to take care of also the knowledge that we have on uh, social um, uh, differences uh, and how to include, work in an inclusive way uh, throughout these processes, it's very crucial for the turnout of the sustainable century. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that was great and very reinforcing. Uh, we appreciate that. And looking forward to sharing what all the different academic areas are doing. Um, and, and our final roundtable participant, and thank you for your patience, is Osama Omar, Associate Professor in Architecture at the Beirut Arab University. Osama.
Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, uh, everyone. Um, Isabel, can you share the slides, please? Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, uh, actually, higher educational plays the, a crucial uh, role in uh, the creation of green economy. Beirut Arab University are taking the initiative to provide our students with more appropriate skills and competences to cope with the demand of a green economy and the sustainable transformation through a range of strategies and various levels from higher educational. Uh, first, in uh, partnership with IEU and leadership in Arab regions uh, with international satellites, Beirut Arab University continues to address SDGs in general and SDG 9 in particular. Uh, second, addressing a green economy community by activating the BEU incubator. BEU continues to create entrepreneur environment and uh, participate in international competitions and program like this slide. Uh, this is the initiative from student about infrastructure, infrastructure project, concrete uh, sustainable prototype. And this is one of uh, green uh, green materials uh, as a, a green uh, one of green economy. Uh, third is green entrepreneurship uh, through established BU innovation hub that aim to connect with startups, with investors, advisors, influencers, and entrepreneurs, and to help them develop and launch their business through our university. And we uh, give them spaces and advising, uh, advising and uh, support them with the facilities and knowledge about that. Um, for the green lens for every job through educational uh, as everyone talked that we need to uh, mapping the sdg in our curriculum and integrate it within undergraduate and graduate courses establishing the entrepreneur mindset so by the university within the facilities curricula builds a bridge between academia and practitioners uh, by encourage practice based research topic through various workshops like critical thinking think tank and to encourage our students to think outside the box uh, and that uh, different type of uh, 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 workshop that student, our students uh, take it. Uh, another initiative that come from Digital Fabrication Lab that we have to proceed in sustainable uh, material for uh, urban planning uh, outside. Um, fifth and last, enhance uh, cross-sector collaboration through operations and governance by addressing the uh, decision makers and uh, UN SDGs in general and uh, SDG 9 in particular in BU strategies to uh, 2020-2030 through this mission, uh, this mention the SDG to community integrating the related SDG uh, innovation uh, infrastructure and uh, um, uh, innovation and uh, infrastructure to student participants uh, related to activities and projects. BU governance structure and operation policies have been aligned with flow of the action related to SDG, including employment financial, finance, uh, campus service, facilities, procurement, HR, and the student administration. And you can find that uh, from several multi-stakeholder, like student, university administrator, uh, ac academia, and uh, other stakeholders. Um, and this is the one of example by uh, make a relationship by UNIDU to uh, make uh, actually two new vocational training center on electricity and solar energy. This vocational center is a good example to how we are preparing our students uh, to future uh, green economy. Thank you very much. That was great. 
thank you. Just think of all the examples that are out there that we can learn from. And these are, these are wonderful ones. Thank you, Osama. We're out of time, but I know that there are questions. And so maybe we can ask Isabel, does this turn off in one minute? Or can we stay on for a few minutes to discuss? Why don't you tell and me, we'll, we can stop the recording and just discuss it's up to we you. We can totally stay on still for questions. So uh, we don't have an expiry date, but we know that people have other commitments, of course. And so it would be really great if um, our speakers maybe have five to 10 minutes and the participants that can stay on, um, they're welcome to do so. Um, I think that, that sounds good. totally up to you, yes. And Pam, maybe if you want to do the thank you and the closing, we'll make the recording that way. And then, then we will stay on and open it up. There was a great question on standards. Um, and I think we're going to have to address that. How do we do that well together? I think there's lots of examples in different countries, but and other great questions too. So Pam, over to you. Thank you very much. And I will go back to what you said in the beginning. I think that this uh, this has to be seen as a start of a lot of um, taking actions. And my message and take home message is that there are so many examples out there and there is no one solutions to what we are discussing. But what we need is a mutual and trustful cooperation between the different actors, because without that, we will not develop together. So that's my take home message uh, to go on uh, with respectful uh, cooperation. And thank you for all giving such a nice view of different things. And, and I think that we have to, to think about what's going on and also take it to our own institutions and to uh, our own countries, because there are so many differences between different countries. Uh, when it comes to how we work and how we implement a green economy. Wonderful. Um, thank you. And thank you for hosting it. Um, I'm going to open up the Q&A section. And so if you have questions you haven't asked yet, you can put them in there and you can upvote them. So we see the ones that people are most interested in getting answered. Um, so when I look at the top, um, there's that question of, how institutions of higher education can better engage with their alumni, especially the graduates who are in a position to make decisions in 22, 23, and that have long-term implications with respect to green jobs and decarbonization. So I know that we need to set up an inter international uh, models of what you can do with your alumni um, so that we can support them. And I think that would be a great topic to share resources and address in the virtual community. But anybody else on the panel want to talk about that? Or if you have something that you can put in the chat of a great example of how you are working with your alumni, that would be wonderful. Um, I can answer about that. Um, actually, we built a database for our alumni from several uh, in each university. And we try to to track their uh, job career and uh, found the possibility to uh, give a public lecture for future uh, undergraduate students. Uh, we make also advisor committee and this advisor committee come from a uh, public figure from our alumni who take uh, a great position in several companies and we take them uh, their advice about how we can upgrade our curricula, how we can, what is needed from our uh, graduate and how we can prepare them if they can uh, take uh, our students for, uh, for summer jobs, for uh, some exercise to do with their job, uh, their companies to guide them what they should have when they are graduate. I think this is a good scenario to do that. Great, great. Other thoughts, Ness? So here's what I would say. There are alumni associations at all the different universities and TVETs. They go after those alumni to get funding. I mean, maybe not true in all countries, but a lot of countries. We have, through our uh, fellow, one of our fellows programs, created a, a document on how do you go to those who care about the environment? And sometimes, you know, there's a long list of the alumni association, they've got to fund the medical school building, etc. But if you say to them, look, we just want to talk to the people who have not responded yet, 
to your fundraising appeals. And we wanna talk about the green economy, the sustainable economy. And we've been able to get past it and then we get the support of the alumni office so that we can help them as well. But please, I do think we need to build out these programs because they find my email address and other colleagues of mine and they show up and say, can you help me? I've graduated and now I'm looking for a job. In the global guidance document, there are three ways for young people to find green jobs. And it's, it's very helpful if you share those. And then there's also links to documents that have multiple websites on career maps and career pathways. Um, so I think providing those to both the students and the graduates would be great. But that's a great question. I think we need to do more. Okay, another question that got uh, more than one vote. Um, as a start, how the procedure for integrating green skills within curriculum can be carried out. Will discrete modules within a course be more practical or a complete mapping for all courses? So thoughts from our group here? Yeah, Elva, you wanna go first and then I'll sound like? Yes, uh, well, um, I can respond a bit on that. Um, me and my predecessor, who's now retired, she actually started uh, a work here at our school, um, going through the different courses uh, and how the curriculum looked like and trying to get more sustainability into that. What we experienced was that, um, or specifically she experienced, was that when courses uh, were taken on by a different persons, some of that sustainability went away. So, and now I see also now some uh, eight years later now, um, we see that we also need to upgrade uh, the sustainability examples and discourse to where the international discussion is today. So we're working pretty much by nudging. Uh, we're talking about this at, uh, when we meet colleagues uh, in department meetings once a month, but also uh, I, uh, specifically uh, have meetings with course responsible people and just have a little chat about what the syllabus looks like and if there's any possible changes or what kind of examples they are using and so forth. Because in that dialogue, I get a, a feedback also. So I know what they're doing, they know what I'm thinking. So I have the specific responsibility on the department uh, from the um, first dean and from the prefect uh, to have this specific task. Great, wonderful. Okay, other thoughts on this? Yes, I think we uh, deal with this uh, uh, this matter in several levels. Uh, one of the levels, uh, we make a capacity building for staff members, academic staff members, about the hot topic, in, uh, especially in faculty of architecture. I am architect and professor of architecture. So we deal with uh, this terminology like a green economy, like solar cell, climate change. And we need to provide a student with the latest hot topics in their uh, disciplines. So we make a capacity building when, between each other as a staff member. So uh, every year we take a decision this, that this is the hot topic and we need to transfer or translate the knowledge to the student uh, through each uh, courses uh, by using uh, problem solving uh, learning or make a research or make a, uh, assignment uh, practice based. Uh, in these uh, practical courses. Uh, we encourage students to take uh, a certificate, international certificate like LEED and BRAIN, LEED uh, Green Associations. It's sustainable uh, certificate to encourage them in future job. I think that's uh, another option. Wonderful. Um, there are a number of questions around the K-12 space. Oh. My short answer to that question is, 
simultaneously. You do it on multiple levels. Wherever you have a sphere of influence, if you can put something into a module in a course, do it, but then share it out at the association of everybody else who teaches that and come share it with the virtual community so that we can share it. And then if you can also do an institutional level approach and you don't need to be the leader to do that, you just need to be somebody who's willing to put in the effort. We've seen that over and over, do that as well. We only have eight years. Um, and so somebody- May I say something here, uh, Deborah? Sure, Helja, of course. Yeah, I, th I think that uh, the other part, because I saw these many questions also as very important ones, and I cannot agree more than, than what you with what you just said, I think that the whole of system approach to education is absolutely key. And this is also relating to so all the different education levels from pre-primary to lifelong. And we should not forget about any of these uh, uh, education levels within the entire sector. And so anybody coming through a higher education system wishing to take on a position in a school or helping out later in, in their businesses to also educate colleagues, that all of that is part of this process leading to a more sustainable future because we all pay, play a very important part in that. And one topic that we didn't touch or one word that didn't um, was not yet raised, I think we also um, are all aware without naming it, that we're all citizens in our societies. And that's what we need is also for, for very well educated and responsible citizens to be educated through the higher education system. And not only savvy in skills and competencies, but really this notion of the, the whole person that we knew through the very notion of what a university stands for, so that we educate the people who are responsible for their own future, the future of the society in which they live, but also responsible for this connection between the local and the global. And that's what this uh, session is uh, also showing. We've, we've never seen so many different cultures in the chat and from so many different countries. From, and so th this is also a very important point that we should always take on board. We are citizens of the world and we have to actually work on the solutions together. And where you said there are so many examples provided, Pam stressed that as well. It's very good to connect those and to confront them in order to see how we can scale them up, how we can also share them in a very constructive way without replicating simply, but really to adapt them to the local situations. And I think that's what the guide also offers to do. And that's what this community of practice is so important for, because you will bring the people together to discuss to always actually get new inspiration through this connectivity uh, around the globe so a very important uh, part there as well that's what i wanted to add <laughs> thank you that's very important i just need to acknowledge aluchi aluchi has been part of our team all the way along um, we wanted you know if we had been able to have more speakers we would have had you too i'm sure you'll speak in the future your great work brought us uh, some of the people that are in the audience today. Thank you. She's working as a fellow both at the University of Lagos, but also with the US partnership. Um, Osama, I think there was a question in the chat for you about your certificates and doing the links. Um, and then also there have been questions about the K-12, about the before higher education and how do we get to the secondary schools and even the primary schools. And here we have a K-12 sector team of the US partnership. There's a lot going on in the K-12 space. Um, we do need to share what we're doing in higher ed with that particularly high school space, right? But also to see what's going on in the younger years as well. So that will be a topic of the virtual community. We will have a section where we'll be able to share those resources because it is important. And I agree with what you just said that Illich is that it's it's not just as workers, but it's as consumers and investors and community members and voters, right? Citizens vote for our country and for the world. Okay, um, other questions that we want to address here that are not addressed already. There were so many. We're not going to get to all of them. And I know um, you had some questions for Power for All. And she had to leave. She said, sorry about that, but she will be coming to um, future meetings in the virtual community. So um, does anybody wanna address the question of 
we also need green indicators, green quality assurance standards and learning and teaching, research, innovation, and service to society in order to provide students with the green skills and to measure the related learning outcomes effectively. There's a lot of literature out there on measuring learning outcomes, but I think uh, this question is key. How do you think these new quality assurance indicators and standards in higher education related to green skills and green outcomes can be developed internationally in a short time? That's the key, right? Any thoughts about how they could be developed in a short time? Yeah, go ahead, Alex. Short time uh, is not always the guarantee for success, but yes, we need them quickly. And maybe you can say a few words, Deborah, as well, or I don't know if Sam, no, you said he's no, no, no longer with us, but otherwise, there's also important work being done uh, in the context of HESI on uh, trying to, um, to transform the um, the measurement tools that are available in order to better integrate the uh, the green part of, of what we should be addressing. So there is a lot of work going on and that will be shared uh, shortly. Maybe Isabel, you wanna say quickly something about that as well. You've been part of that team to rethink uh, the, the, uh, the measurement uh, tools that are available. Um, no, I mean, I think there's a lot of different work streams going on um, at the same time. I can share the HESI link because I'm not sure if it's um, available yet. And I mean, the question is more to, to how to deal with assessments and what internal mechanisms also to find at institutions or what external mechanisms to use for, for this type of evaluation and assessment. And um, I'm just, yeah, just wanted to say really quickly that there's been so great presentations and ideas here today, and I really hope we can connect to that. And um, yeah, thank you to all. If I don't get the chance anymore, I'll say it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, a couple of things. Somebody said some of these technological um, solutions are expensive. What do we do about that? I say two things. One is you got to create the financing. You got to create the financing for a net positive cash flow. When people can uh, pay as they save, then it becomes a no brainer for them to make that switch. Daniel knows there are business models like that out there. We need more financiers training in our finance classes of how to do that blended finance, how to set up those systems. But also lots of times the solutions exist, people don't even know about them. So educating the consumers, and that's something we can do from the higher ed sector as well. The other piece is there is something to be said for local materials. So decades ago, when I went to Mexico to teach architects and engineers about solar, we went to the local hardware store. We built low cost, we bought low cost materials and we built things. We built things that could clean the water, that could heat the water instead of using the fossil fuel that they were using. So um, lots of creative ways to do that. There's an international group called EPIC, N-E-P-I-C-N, and it, it helps professors and educators, instructors, connect their students with real world problems in their local communities. Um, and so it's got a nice model for that. It's once again, EPIC, N. But I don't wanna get too far in the weeds. And of course, we're not gonna answer all of the questions here. So it, I don't know, should we call it a day? What do you guys think? Is there anybody who's, Oh, I do want to say one thing. Somebody asked a question about, it's difficult for us in oil and gas engineering to talk about green energy. Any advice? And I would go back to um, look at the formal and then the informal power structure. Uh, you might start a brown bag about people who care about the environment and want to have a clean environment, like a virtual brown bag. Um, so that that way you'll find out who's aligned with you within the company. And then you can look at, okay, how can we bring forward these ideas? We've got to shift the oil and gas industry, right? From let's hold on and burn as much as we can to we need to be an energy company, not just a fossil fuel company. And uh, we have people who do marketing and research and all sorts of applications within higher ed that could Maybe sometimes you need outside experts to help you make that shift. But what we found from market research is that people care about having a safe future for their families. They care about having clean air and clean water. 
and that we've learned how to talk across the political spectrum, which has not been easy in the US. And I apologize for the polarization that's going on. And we haven't been able to do more, but we're working on it still. Um, but we've learned how to find that common ground. And all of us, I think, have those challenges around the world. And we can help each other with it. Um, I think I'm just going to go to closing comments now from the from the panel here, does anybody have closing comments that they would like to make? Okay. I think Osama, uh, Dr. Osama had also had to leave, so we're really a bit over time, but yeah, thank you to everyone who still stayed on. Um, maybe you want to do the closing comments, Deborah, together with the village and Noemi wants to come in again. Yeah, sure, I'll come in very briefly, but thank you very much. It's been a great, great session. Uh, for real, the energy that came out from the session is really positive. I really think, as we mentioned uh, many times during that session, that it will lead to fruitful discussions afterwards with the events that are organized, but also, of course, this virtual community that we all invite you to join. And um, yeah, thank you so much for your participation to stay on a long time, but this has been very useful and i hope it will be helpful for all of you thank you so much thank you everybody once I again i say thank you for what you've already done but even more so thank you for what you're going to do in the future you'll hear from us about the virtual community the slides the recording looking forward to getting to know you all better yeah sorry Hillich, go ahead no, I wanted to play the, the, the middle part of the sandwich. <laughs> you nap, I, you, you nap. <laughs> but it's, this is just pretty, this is perfectly fine. I wanted to thank everyone as well. Great questions in the chat. We've copied them. Uh, great questions in the Q&R. Uh, and we're very pleased uh, to, to have seen such a, a lively enthusiasm, both in the chat and in the, in the question and answer area of, the, of, the, of this. This is only the start of a much longer conversation. And again, let me thank all of those who spoke for their uh, very interesting contributions to, uh, to the debate, for all the examples shared, for the, the connectivity between all of us. And thank you, um, very, very special thank you, Deborah and Isabel, for your um, development, for the development uh, of this webinar as we saw it unfold today. So have a very great uh, end of day or start of day, wherever you are around the world and just looking forward to next steps. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, speakers. Thank you, organizers. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>